SHOT Show 2020. This is amazing. I had the opportunity to come over to SIG's new booth that Hannah had tipped me off to earlier in a podcast that was coming. Um, got the one and only Daniel Horner. Appreciate you it's letting me come a, out here. Yeah, it's been a challenge trying to get to you and get you on, and I know why now. You're in the hunting game. The cross, amazing. Yeah. I had an opportunity to see you shoot it. We were over at the range day, the, uh, the private range day for SIG. Really an amazing experience. Everything about it was first class, which you'd expect nothing less from SIG. It's been really a, a, a phenomenal experience to see this in person and then see you run it. Yep. So before we get to you, mm -hmm. tell me a little bit about this and the genesis <laughs> of this and just, you know, it's just really exciting to see that bolt game come down to reality, the price point, everything that's in it and what's involved. And then to see you run it and how seamless it was, amazing. Yeah, it's a great little gun. It really is. Uh, we, the, the history of the gun is really cool too. So um, when, uh, when this kind of concept came out, it, the, the, the thought to have a one piece receiver had been around for quite some time. Uh, the guys at SIG had kind of had the idea for a while and were, were thinking about doing it and then it kind of got shelved for, for a couple of years. Um, and then Patrick Hanley, Hanley our uh, rifle programs manager, he came out and said, hey, you know, I think it's time when you get in the bolt gun game, we can do something different. You know, the, the technology to manufacture the one piece receiver had really matured to where it was, it was uh, viable um, and able to do it at a reasonable price. Uh, so what he did was um, went to his boss, John Brasser, said, hey man, this is where we need to go. We can do something pretty cool here. He and John put together a plan, went to Ron Cohen and said, hey, this is what we want to do. Here's why, built the business case and everything. And Ron said, okay, you can do it, but you have to do it the SIG way. You know, it has to be, it has to be everything that the hunter wants. It needs to be durable. It needs to have all the features and it needs to be at a price point that makes sense. Uh, so with that, they left the office and started assembling a, a team. So they got feedback, or he built a team with uh, special operations snipers, um, hunters, professional hunters, and competitive shooters. And we all went in to the room and we all sat around a round table and he started writing stuff down on the whiteboard. And we went from the end of the rifle, one end of the rifle to the other, mm. uh, with features that we would all want. The snipers were really, uh, really wanted the modularity and the adaptability. Right you know, able to interact with uh, tripods and then uh, adjustable cheek pieces and things like that. Because I w when I went to sniper school, you know, they they literally handed me my M24 sniper rifle in a bag with moleskin and duct tape. Mm. And you would go out there and you'd build your cheek piece up and all that. So this is, this is experiences that uh, the snipers had had and they're like, hey, you know, we don't want that. Uh, the competition shooters, you know, everybody wants extreme accuracy and a really good trigger. And then the hunters, what their main focus on was the size as far as the compactness of the rifle, and number one was weight. Uh, so with those kind of... And what's the total weight unloaded magazine? Unloaded is uh, less than six and a half pounds. Yeah, so right. a couple ounces difference between the 308 barrel and the 6.5 barrel, but it's an extremely light rifle. With the buttstock folded, it's less than 25 inches. So um, as we kind of, as, as the rifle started continuing to develop and things like that all the features you know started to come out um, the one piece receiver is really great because this eliminates the need for any type of a chassis or a stock totally so we've got the one piece receiver the buttstock uh, the barrel everything bolts to this um, and basically it allows your rifle to be as accurate as the barrel uh, because there's nothing else really interfacing with it the barrels come Pre head spaced from the factory, so if you want to change the barrel, change the caliber, or anything like that, you can do it with an AR-15 wrench and the tools you've probably got laying around the house right now. Um, the bolt throw is 60 degrees, so uh, it, that's important. A lot of people think about the bolt angle as a speed thing, right. but it's really not. Like it doesn't matter. There's right. no time advantage. Mm -hmm. But what is an advantage is with a 90 degree bolt throw you're gonna rack your thumb on the scope. So we, we, uh, we wanted the 60 degree bolt throw just to give you a little more clearance between the scope and the bolt hander, handle when you go to cycle the action or uh, load the next round. Um, Toolessly adjustable butt stock. So we got the, uh, 
We got the butt stock here where you can uh, adjust comb height. You can adjust length of pull with one screw here. You can slide the butt stock up and down with one button. If you want, you can take these two screws and adjust cant. Mm. So basically, this is this is a very similar stock to uh, what I would use on like a thousand yard um, accuracy competition rifle. Mm -hmm. The only difference is it's extremely lightweight. So uh, you got to get these things to fit you to be able to really exploit all the advantages. Um, and this thing is it's easy to make that happen. There's a couple things that really amaze me about it that I feel are blow me out of the water. Obviously, you know, having worked and been the CEO of a long range rifle company and understanding the marketability of something, what blows my mind is the price point at seventeen hundred bucks, right around yeah, seventeen hundred bucks. MSRP. MSRP. Because you can't buy an action, Daniel. A no. decent action for eight hundred bucks. I have a twenty two that costs 1800 bucks. So I was like, <laughs> I, you know, I look around, are we witnessing the death of thousand dollar chassis? I mean, everything's gonna still have a place, but you're not, I mean, map on this is 1499. You're, you can't, anywhere in this room, you can't go in this room anywhere and find these features for that price. It's because absolutely Because when impossible. I look at something like this, what I'm looking <laughs> at is a resetting of the market. Yeah. And what the expectation is of the market. Exactly. And with six manufacturing capability and what they bring to the table, yeah. I just see this as an unbeatable option because why would you go out there just to just to talk to the average person that's building a bolt gun and maybe not the, the affectionado that might right. go out and wants to put those things in their gun. Why would you go out and spend a thousand dollars on a chassis, eight hundred dollars on a bolt, and you know you're looking at and other accessories. We're not even getting into stocks. Right, you know, right. you're talking about another thousand dollars just to get the thing up and running. Forget about a scope. And right. now you're into it for three times the price or two times at least. Yeah, and the thing the weighs twice as much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you're getting everything you want. Well, now, in the other, like, to for me, I, I've shot bolt guns for a long time. A lot of competition stuff. A lot of sniper stuff. If you do it long enough, your action screws will come loose at some point. You know. This doesn't even have action screws. The, we're, we have a scope base that's coming that you're gonna eliminate the need for a scope base. So you're, just, you're gonna bolt your scope rings directly to that, that receiver. So it, it's, it's an advancement. It's not just an adaption. Now, you talked a little bit about what was involved in the development of this and who was involved. The big question I have is, at what point did you get involved in the testing of the prototypes and start to say, hey, we gotta tweak this and we gotta tweak that? Well, so, as soon as those all from from, from computer onset. drawing okay. until the time we were shooting a gun was about seven months mm -hmm. which is it, insane which I is mean, well, yeah which is unheard of because i remember asking julie galoo but you know i said when do you get involved with the with those platforms and she says you know a little further along every company has like a little different process yeah. i like to hear when guys or, or gals are involved from the onset yeah, yeah. that to me and, is the most exciting because you always want to work for a brand that listens, right? Oh, 100%. And SIG always listens to yeah. the feedback from its guys, and that's the vibe I get from Max yeah. and Lena and now you. So that's so important it, when you're developing. And I got something. to be involved in in pretty much all the steps of this, and it was it was great because they were kind enough to listen to, to what I had what, to say. What part of but, this you feel best reflects your personality that you had to say in? Uh, we had a, quite the little... Uh, conversation about where the mag button's located. It yeah. sounds like a silly little thing. No, not at all. But it really was. So uh, the competition shooters wanted a big mag release that you could hit easily and allow the mag to to fall out. All the snipers were like, the last thing I want is my bolt action rifles magazine coming out quickly. Uh, right. Almost no one's ever had to do a speed reload on a bolt gun. Was but, it, but everybody has had that time when the sling catches right. the release and dumps the mag on the ground. Was it easy to choose a different magazine? I mean, was it easy to choose the magazine you went with, or were you thinking of going with something different? We were originally, yeah, we were originally going to go with a like an SR25 type magazine, but this gun can shoot the new 277 Sig Fury, and we wanted to increase the bolt lug strength a little bit. And when we did that, it just didn't make sense to try to run an SR25 style magazine or AR10 style magazine. What? We, we had, to, this made a lot more sense. Now, what's your favorite caliber? Because I know it comes in multiple. So, uh, right now, I'm the 277, just because it's new and cool. I mean, mm -hmm. and, and if y'all haven't heard of it, it's a, uh, it's a, we call it the hybrid case technology. So, it's a three piece design where the head of the case, j just the rim where the extractor goes, is made of stainless steel. And then we take a brass tubing and, uh, 
that makes the rest of the case that you would normally see when you're loading the, the round. And then there's a lock washer that goes down in there uh, to hold the brass and the stainless steel together. And it allows you to shoot a bullet at 80,000 PSI extremely safely. That is, uh, that's very, very, very safe in that uh, cartridge. It's not even getting close to what it can do. Um, but, you know, I tell people, this is the same as going from black powder to smokeless powder mm -hmm. with this case technology. So if you think about a 45 ACP shooting about a 200 grain bullet, right? It shoots at 20, 22,000 PSI as Sammy spec. A 300 Win Mag shoots about a 200 grain bullet at 60,000 PSI Sammy spec. We're at 80,000 PSI. I mean, it's a massive game. And I think it's pretty safe to assume, without giving away any inside baseball, that this is just the beginning in these calibers. The Department of Defense came out and said, we want to shoot this projectile at this velocity, and that's gonna be the future of the Army. That's why we have what we have. But my gut tells me next year, yeah. there may be more. Maybe, just maybe. We can neither confirm nor deny it. <laughs> but I know loosely there's been chatter, and, and, and hopefully that happens. We all know right. that that happens, because I think I do believe we're witnessing the death of $1,000 chassis and that type of system because you're getting it all right here. Right, yeah, I mean, and there's so, there's so many advantages to this. There's so many less failure points. There's so much more rigidity. You know, guys talk about um, betting their actions, right? This is basically a giant betting block. Right. You know, I mean, it, it can't get more solid than one piece of metal. Now, this is amazing. This is something... And it's no secret, and I talked to Max about this, and I've talked to Lena about this, everything SIG touches, they do to the max. I mean, yeah. there is not another booth in the building you can come to where you have everything. Right. You can get an optic, you can get a, a rifle, you can get a pistol, you can get a um, suppressor, you get everything that you want right here, and now ammo, right. which is great. So everything comes out of this booth. Now, where does it go from here, Dave? What is the next thing? Like what? What, what mountain is next to conquer? Well, it, you talked to one of the most impressive things that I've heard here was Mr. Cohen. He said, I, I, you know, I asked him what his philosophy was the first day when I got here and um, when I was interviewing, and he said, I hire the best people in the world and I let them do their job. So you hire the, you know, our pistol programs manager is a, is a national competitive shooting champion. And so basically what's going to happen is you're just going to let these visionaries of these guys continue to run wild and improve on what they do. Every single person here, you know, we come out with new products constantly. It's not because anybody's it's pushing that. It's because the guys that are in charge want to move forward. The guys that are working with them want to move the ball forward. You know, they, they look at everything now and see what it can be tomorrow. So the evolution is simply just everyone in this room trying to do the best that they can do every single day. Now, I want to change gears for a minute. And we'll come back to this. Um, I've heard everybody's story about how SIG came to be. How Lena began to form her relationship, of course, with her rich history in the, in the business. And Max had the most heartfelt story. You know, it was Katrina. You know, everybody was, you know, underwater. His family needed money. I mean, it was amazing. Like, I was blown away because I didn't know the story. And I've known Max for quite a few years now. I was blown away hearing that story. And I remember sending it over to Jason, and I'm like, this is an amazing clip. Uh, it's a tough one to beat, but how did your relationship come to be now? How did I get here? Yeah, how did so, you get here? How did I get here? How did you so, sneak in this place? I, uh, it's actually pretty funny because uh, a long, long time ago, uh, one of the guys here that works in the military side, he was a, uh, the platoon sergeant down at 3rd Ranger Battalion. Yep. Uh, and Robbie Johnson worked for him, and Jason St. John worked for him, and a bunch of the guys that I worked at with the AMU worked for this one guy so that's now sick. you had a few second party connections. Yeah, and so I was in the, the Army for a long time, and uh, you know, we all keep track of each other, and everybody moves around, and um, you know, I, I, Robbie's, you know, my best friend outside of the Army for sure, and he, uh, he works here at SIG, so I would see what he's doing. You know, he'd tell me how great it, it was to work here and all of that type stuff. And, uh, but the longer he, he was here, the more of those guys from my, you know, when I was a private in the army, they all started gravitating over to SIG because that was where 
you know, everybody was at, and that was who was doing the best work. Um, so I, I was looking to get out of the Army, and I went and interviewed at a, a bunch of manufacturers and was looking at taking a job here, there, and I actually was hesitant to go with SIG because they make everything. So, right. you know, now I have one company to work we'll for. We'll get to that, yeah, it begins yeah. to pigeonhole you a little right. bit in this business. And, um, but I'm telling you, like, when I went there and Tom Taylor, uh, the our vice president, he uh, he's like, hey, come up here and just give it a chance. And, you know, he's a wonderful guy. I've known him for years and huge, res very respected in the industry. Um, so I came here and, of course, I interviewed with him and he's just the normal Tom, just the best guy in the world. And then I got to meet Ron Cohen. And when he said that to me, when he said that he hires the best people and lets them do their job, I'm like, what more could you ask for in a boss? That's, that's the American dream. Because the biggest thing we look for, it's a little bit of a tip to everyone out there, and in any relationship with a manufacturer or business you get into, whether you're an influencer, shooter, anything, whatever you call yourself, you're looking for people that listen. Yeah. You're looking, but you have to earn that right to listen. Oh, hundred percent. You know what I mean? So it comes with, it's good and bad. It, so a lot of people think they're just going to walk around here in BDUs and people are just going to yeah. listen to them. It's not going to happen. Yeah. You have to earn that right to be listened to. And you have such a rich track record. I was reading your bio the other day and I'm doing a little research into you. You have a, an insanely rich history in competition shooting coming up almost a similar path as Max in many ways. And you have a, a really rich history getting out there and competing. I was reading, I was blown away because I, I had, uh, you know, never really heard of much about you and meeting you, I can understand why. You're a super humble dude. You don't say much. You're one of those guys that's constantly looking and analyzing. And I'm asking, you know, around, I'm like, what's with Daniel? You know what I mean? I'm like, I, I'd love to do an interview with him. I'm like, you know, like, he's patient. He takes his time. You know, he listens. And I'm like, all right. And I'm like 80, you know, I'm like, you know, I have a million miles of energy. But when I got to know you a little bit and we were chatting and going back and forth and you start to open up a little bit, it's such a great refreshing disposition to have in so many ways. It's almost refreshing and it fits in the team and so well. Yeah. Because you have Max who's like, you know, the quiet storm. You have Lena who's a straight storm and then you have, you know, it's a great mix. And I think what you guys are doing here is really exciting. But your history coming up, I was blown away at how many wins and the things that you've accomplished. I know you guys don't like to talk about it, Max. It's like, oh gosh, yeah. God, you know. But it's it's amazing the team and, and how you know you arguably have the best female shooter in the world. Oh yeah. You you without sure. a doubt have one of the best speed shooters in the planet. Yeah. And now you get to complement that with the all around package. It's yeah. really exciting. Oh, I love it, man. I mean, it, Lena Lena does the best job explaining the team, you know, and, and yeah, I'll, I won't fantastic. do it justice. But you know, everybody's got their strengths. I, Max is extremely he's a professional shooter. I mean, he is Oh yeah. he lives it, breathes it, has personal trainers. I mean, that he he is the epitome of what a professional competition shooter can be. Lena is ex one of the best marketing, social media, people engaging personalities that Amazing. I've ever met. Yeah. And I'm fortunate to have had a lot of experience with product development and getting to be involved with uh, prototype stuff for years and years and years so i've got a real technical yeah. yeah i like the i like building new things and and like hey you know let's change the spring pressure on that bolt release like every time i pick up that gun that's what I, you know that's what i think you know i want to i'm i'm similar like i see what it is and it's great and i want to make it better <laughs> so yeah what i what I, I you hit the nail on the head you know we, we spent some time talking to melina with the social media she's a wizard at that very adaptable and it's real. That's what right. I love about her. If you meet her, she's a ball of energy. Yeah, what you, you see on the internet, is that's Lena. It's 100% real. Yeah. And I've said for years, between her and Ashley, they didn't even have a TV show. I said it, I've been <laughs> saying something for years. You could, you could print the money if they had that. But, you know, Max, what I love about him and his personality is Max is a lot like me. He loves to surround himself with SMEs. So like Max one time was at a, a Saints football game, he's a huge Saints junkie, and he goes, I noticed you had Heath Evans on your podcast, so he's like, I'd love to meet him. Send a text, get them connected. He loves, to, you know, Heath won a couple of Super Bowls, he loves talking to subject matter experts, he loves aligning with SMEs and picking their brain, and he's always calculating and listening and processing and listening. And he has that same approach I have, because I've always said something similar, instead of hire the best people, I say, surround yourself with SMEs and good shit will happen in plain English. That's, that's, that's what you have to do. Get yeah. the best around you or target the best and things will come together, but you have to be willing to listen. Um, 
you have a little bit of that disposition, like you said, where you're into the, the minutia of it, the nuts, mm -hmm. the bolts, the weeds. And that's insanely important because when you're working and developing. It's just another, the, another gap to fill, man. It's another like, gap I, to yeah, fill. I like, I love, I can sit here and bore you to death about the 277 Secure pressures and all that. And Lena is just not what she is passionate about, just like I'm not passionate about social media. Mm. So when you put us all together, it really is, I, I, I don't think it could be any better. I got to get your honest opinion on what do you think of social media? Because you're not a social media guy. Um, you know, part of this, I, I want to. I want to highlight everything that you're about in, in so many ways. Do you feel that's something you need to grow in or you're just like, fuck right. it, I just want to win? No, no, I don't. I mean, win it, winning to me is something that I, that's my validity. I can go out there and I can say, I've won a dozen national championships. That gives me the capability to walk into a room and say, this is what's yep. right. Exactly. This is how we need to build a one to six variable power scope because I took it and beat everybody in the country and this is what we need to do. That's that is why why that's my passion for winning. So that someone will give me the time of day and allow me to sit in a meeting and and improve something. That's why I want to win. Um, as far as what do I think about social media? It's okay to hate it. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's okay. I, I don't I don't want to say I hate it, but uh, there's a whole lot of people that will say a whole lot of stuff to me on the internet that they would never say to my face. Amen. Amen. <laughs> So, I had that problem yesterday. So, yeah. it, it, that's insanely true. And it's it's really, social media is interesting. I try to explain it to people, and specifically in the gun industry. We all know what it is. And, yeah. and Lena said it the other day. It's everybody trying to throw it on the table and, and say this. But you're exactly right. Most of the people just walk right by you. They don't say anything. They don't, you know, everybody has a social media personality. I've said the same thing for years. I'm waiting for the moment on social media, and I said I'd love to see a law come down or something where you have to use your real name or your business yep. name. You gotta, you, you gotta sign in you with your freaking social security card. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, but my, uh, you know, but there's two things. I'll tell you this. Okay. These are my two, my two things on social media. There's two poems that I live my life by. One is the man in the arena, and the other one is the man in the glass. And if you look those up, it, it, the man in the arena says it's not the critic who counts, not the the man who judges how harshly how someone else did what they did, it, it belongs to the man who's actually in the arena with the, whose face is marred with blood and sweat and strives and fails and who at best, uh, or who at worst knows the, the sour taste of defeat or whatever and at best knows the sweet taste of victory, but it's, he will never be with those cold, timid souls who know neither victor, victory or defeat. Okay. And then the man in the glass basically ends with, you know, if, as long as when you look in a mirror, you're proud of what you see, nothing else really matters. So I can put a post up on social media and get a million likes or put a post up on social media and get no likes. And honestly, I couldn't care less. I always say my, you know, I've said it a hundred times in this podcast, my approach to it, because I've been in a million different businesses and genres. And I've seen it. I've seen a lot in terms of social media. I see guys, you know, they're like competitors and this and that, and they, you know, they think they deserve that that rightful place, and they do. And there's also people that are social media personalities or influencers or ambassadors, the dirty word, and they deserve think that they deserve because they're media presence. I always say, expect nothing, blame no one, and do your job. That's it. Yeah, expect well, nothing, blame it, and that's a super yeah. New England thing to say. Yeah. Being from there, growing up 60 miles from Sig, having that that Belichickism built into my brain. Expect nothing, blame no one. Do your job, yeah. whatever your job is. If this is your specialty and that's what you're paid to do and that's all they care about, focus on that. But don't neglect the other side of it. You can't hate the devil you don't know. No, and yeah, love 100%. the devil you do know well, unconditionally. When you're in the when you're in this so when you're in, at six hour. Like I can't even, I, I honestly can't even tell the people the ca the quality of people that we have here because what they've done and what they did can't be told. Mm -hmm. And you can't walk into a room and say that I'm anything special, you know, when that guy's sitting across the table from you, you know? I mean, they, oh, they're I know. like real American heroes, honest to God American heroes work at this company and you would never know. I, right. I, tell, I tell some of these stories about some of the guys that work here to other SIG employees and they're like, I had no idea. You know, you got a guy with a, a bronze star with valor, you know, or a silver star, you know, sitting at a, a table, you know, just 
putting his two cents in, you right. know? And, and he doesn't, you know, and if a guy like that doesn't consider himself special, what does winning a Nationals compare? It's all perspective, you know? right? It's yeah. keeping things in perspective and understand the juggling. Now, for you, it's, it's a balance between multiple worlds, and I've been saying this for a long time, in social media and even in marketing and putting stuff out there, gone are the days that you can just have an Instagram presence. You have to have your hands in a little bit of everything. Yeah. Like I went and I followed your page last night and I was looking, doing my research. You have to have your hand in a little bit of everything. I tell people all the time, if that's what you're good at, that's your forte, yep. and you've never shot a gun, never got a bronze star, never got a purple heart, never did any of those things, then be the best at it. Be yeah. amazing at it. 100%. Be somebody that people come to for expertise. You know what I mean? My dad always said, if, you, if, if you're a ditch digger, be the best ditch be digger the in the best world. Ditch digger you, know? you can be. Yep. And there's and, nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Because I think this business is beginning to shift in a good way in some ways as it pertains to social media. Because now when people come up to the booths and I have a role at a company, I, you know, and they say, I, well, I have this Instagram. I'm like, that's not enough anymore. What else do you have? Where are well, your experts? And what's the qual what quality? Do you what have a community or do you what, just have followers? What yeah. quality of person are you? You know, like honestly, like anybody can put anything up on the internet. I can make the best day look like the worst or the worst day look like the best. Well, but what kind of quality of person are you? And I think on social, it's always going to be the best snapshot of your day. And that's what it should be. I always say, take the rock approach to social media. You should always be smiling. It should be the best part of your day. And it should be a place you go to smile. I put up a lot of pictures of my relationships and my friends and people I've met with and spend time with. And I'm just really enjoy the moment. And I try to take it in for all it is and get to know the person. And I got into podcasting and other things. And a lot of it was because I was going around and having conversations like I'm having with you or I would have with Max. And I'm like, I should just record this. This is just good stuff. And people just want to hear it. But I think there's always going to be a love hate between the two things. And one of my passion plays was always to put a voice behind all of the shooters and people in the defense community. So one of the reasons I wanted to go around and not limit it to shooting and put UFC and other areas in was I wanted people to realize that all the folks that are out there that are shooters, that are part of these great brands, that they're not uh, bad people. They're good people. And no. everybody um, has no. a great shining personality. There are some, of course, there's always some bad apples. But I think um, there's a stigma that comes along with the shooting world, and it's not a rightful one. As far as the people? The judgment. Are... You know, people just see a photo of you with a gun, and they say, oh, you know, this dude's no good, or this is bad. It oh, becomes yeah, political, yeah. and it becomes a thing. So I'm trying to put more of a voice behind it. The, the other side is I feel like the people that speak out, like there, there's there's many, many, many more people who see that and just appreciate what it is and continue to move on and, you know, are on your side, but they don't voice their opinion versus the person who is against you. They get on there and they're the ones that take time to comment and say right. something. On a, you know, just just to drag people down. So, I have to ask another million dollar question. We've asked Lena, we've asked Max, I've asked Shane, I've asked everybody in the in the in, in the building. This, it's the zombie apocalypse. You're running out of Sig's front door. What are you grabbing? Seven sixteen. Why? We need to know the why. Because I can shoot anything with a seven sixteen. I can I can stop pretty much anything. Yeah, and Lena was like ammo, and <laughs> lots of ammo, all kinds of ammo. <laughs> oh, yeah, I mean, I assumed, I assumed it was a package. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, so, yeah. you know, so you're running out, that's what you're grabbing. Uh, either that or a, uh, I might take a, a MCX, depending, MCX on, depending, on, depending on the capabilities of the zombies. Okay. So no, wait, if, yeah, they're, if they're in vehicles, you know, <laughs> I'm taking the 308. If they're not, Lena said that the other day. Her zombies, what? They Did they not die at initial shot? How did they? Uh, they they were fast. They were fast. They were, she had fast zombies. Are of course, zombies Lena's fast? fast would be would, zombies would be fast. She she would be bored if they were slow zombies. Yeah, and it <laughs> has to be headshots. Yeah, I think it has to be headshots. I don't think right? you can kill a zombie any other yeah, way. They're survival. They're surviving zombies. <laughs> yeah. they keep they're, they're crawlers. Yeah. So you're grabbing that, and you know it's interesting to see these evolutions and all the things that have taken place at Sig. If it wasn't a, a Sig product, are you going to take the Shane Cooley answer and use a chainsaw? No. Definitely not. Okay. Shane used to work for me. Shane would take a chainsaw. He would yeah. do it just for fun. He wanted a chainsaw. When it went from a, it went from a, I'm not going to say the word, the, his company, to a, to a chainsaw real quick. So, uh, if it's not going to be a chainsaw, what's it going to be? A non-sig product. What's your? What's ultimate? that? 
What's your alt product to kill the zombies? I, w I mean, it's the zombies, man. I got it. I, why in the world would I not have a SIG product? There you I, go. My life's on the line. Exactly. <laughs> so, total branding. So, we tackled the zombie apocalypse. What is it you want to see? What is SIG not offering yet that you want to see come in? Be critical for a oh, moment, you know? Man, uh, well, it, it's all stuff that's in the works. You know, all, you know, this hybrid ammo is its going to change the way you look at what rifles are capable of doing. I mean, it, it's, it really is going to be... It's going to be nuts. We're going to be doing, you're going to be doing stuff with six pound short action rifles that you used to do with long action magnums, and you'll be doing stuff with long action magnums that has never been done before. But if it's not in the works, would you like to see them get more into the soft goods space? Is that something that you have interest in? Is there something uh, down that line that you're jonesing one, on that you want to be like, Tom, hey, I want to look at this? One thing I, uh, is image stabilization in binoculars. That's a that's it's a an big interesting one. one. Yeah, uh, me and my sniper partner Tyler Payne, um, we kind of brought that to where it was really prominent in the sniper community, and I still stand by it. And you just see this massive shift of guys going to image stabilized image stabilized binos over a spot and scope and tripod, because I, now I've got a you know one three to five pound object that I can just clip under my arm. I can still climb and shoot and do whatever, but I can pull these up and I've got basically a spotting scope here versus I've got an eight pound tripod and a seven pound spotting scope on my back, you know, and they're just, they take forever to, to deploy. Um, and then same thing for hunters. I don't know why anyone goes in the woods uh, without set image stabilized bonus. I mean, right. it, it's the amount of detection that you have, the increased capabilities with image stabilization it's just it's massive so you've been a hunter your whole life yeah what's your favorite hunt uh duck hunting with my dogs okay yeah what kind of dogs you got two black labradors they're okay. they're little rock stars man they're all good right. good hunters all right what do you do for backcountry hunts anything uh so we took that gun on a backcountry hunt uh in october and uh, what do you mean? What, what do I do? What do you look for? What, what type of oh, tag elk. are you seeking? What do you, what's the next big, big end? I like elk because Elks. they're, they're man, they're so good. Because they, <laughs> right? yeah. they taste yeah. good, right? Because they taste good, right? They're so great. Yeah. You know. uh, we got a bunch of, I live in South Georgia. We got a bunch of whitetail deer. And okay. man, you just, it, it doesn't compare to, to elk, I don't think. And what's your favorite caliber for whitetail and for elk? Uh, I'm a big fan of the 6.5 Creedmoor for whitetail. Uh, it works great. And yeah. If I had if I had one caliber, it would be. I, I like big stuff. I like 300 Norma, yep. 28 Nosler. You know, I like stuff like that. So yeah, I I, I did. I love what the Nosler brand has done for yeah. ammo. It's hard not to. Yeah. But I don't like to bring it up because we were talking about this the other day. You become a snob. You know what I mean? I shoot Nosler. Yeah. I mean, you can kill anything that walks the planet with a 300 Win Mag, yeah. and it's been doing it for for years. Mm -hmm. There's just better ways to do it. You know. Yeah. And my go-to right now is a. 28 nozzler with a 195 and it's going about 32 10 so now when you're not shooting what are you doing uh i it sounds super cliche but like my so my wife uh she she was the editor of recoil magazine for a while and she just left i mean basically what me and my family do is guns i mean it is literally 24 7 365 we're either shooting or tearing into something or writing about something. I mean, it's this is pretty much what I do, man, all the time. It's a shooting household. It right? is, it really is. It's like a giant team room. Our whole house is just a giant team room. <laughs> there's, so, there's sniper rifles on one side, there's gas guns on the other side, and it's, yeah. So let everybody know, I wanna give everybody an idea. What do you have planned for 2020? What's the big splash? Where are you gonna be? What are you gonna be up to? Uh, How many matches do you plan on running? So. Nationals is my my big match of the year. You know, I always want to win that. Um, and then uh, I usually shoot six to twelve three gun matches a year. And um, so that's like I said, that's that's the validity that that allows me to have a voice. Um, and it also allows me to represent the company and prove that the products we make are the best. Mm -hmm. uh, then I do a lot of military training, and uh, that's that's just. A passion. That's what I love to do. Right. You know, I like to I like to work with guys that are going and deploying and and doing good work. Um, and then uh, I only do a couple of 
I might do a couple of other classes throughout the year. So I'm, I'm one now, thing I'm probably going to do this year. I'm really excited about. I, I haven't quite got it all planned out. Is I'm really going to push uh, a mental management class um, because you, you talk to a lot of people and they say, hey, you know, you ask them what percentage of what you do is mental, and I mean, what would you say? You, most people say 80 percent, 90 percent, yeah. And then you ask them, well, if, if that's 80 to 90 percent of what you do, how how much of your time and how much of your resources go to bettering that aspect? And most people give the same answer that I gave when I started down this, and it was zero, you know, because there's it's very limited information. A lot of the stuff that is out there isn't vetted very well, you know. And it's of been, course, it's been taught by people who've never really done it. So, no, uh, yeah, no, I, I told I can't, I can't agree more with you because a lot of it's bandwidth. Some companies they just want to become a rifle company. They want to become this. There's not enough bandwidth for them to get out there and truly vet the product the way that it needs to or they're trying to reinvent the wheel. They're trying to solve a problem that doesn't exist. That's a very common one in the gun industry that happens a lot. You know, you see guys running around with quadruple carbon fiber stands, slings with 97 clips and everything. You know, there's not a, a, a problem for that. So they create a product and it, there's not really a need for it. And they don't do enough research into price point and market research and understand where, where it's going, well, where it even is, which is sometimes a problem. What other companies, and I asked everybody this to try to get uh, an answer, and it does, there doesn't be anything in six space. When you walk around the show or you're bopping around, what other companies do you look at from afar and you're like, geez, I really like what they're doing? Mm, I like to go see all the new stuff, like all the guys are, because every now and then you'll see something that, you know, catches a guy, your eye, a pouch, yeah, anything. You know, a guy, well, yeah, a guy that's sitting there and he's got, you know, what he has is cool. But he doesn't maybe doesn't have the vision for what it right. you know really you can't could get the be, brand to the next or, level. or he just doesn't see it. You know, he says, "Hey, you know, I've been focused on this one thing, and this one thing's become my world." And you go over there and you're like, "Hey, man, like, have you thought about working with like this company over here, or bringing it over here, and maybe incorporating this way?" And they're like, "You see, like the light bulb come on. They're like, holy crap, man! I never thought about it for this product. Like, you know, and it takes them, it takes them from, you know, just a little niche thing to like, you know, something that could uh, that could change the industry." Right. Where do you feel the most innovation has come in the industry the last couple of years, whether it's in rifles, soft goods, ammo? Oh, it, it unquestionably for the next, I mean, people, that hybrid ammo is without a doubt the, the leap forward. That, that is, that hasn't been done since, I literally would compare that to black powder smoke powder. I mean, that was the last time that we've had a revolution like that. What do you feel when you look across this entire industry? And this is something Max and I have debated offline uh, a lot, and, and with mutual friends in the business. This industry is lacking the most, whether it's from a media perspective all the way down to a product perspective. Like if you could have everybody in a room with a me megaphone for a minute, what do you feel it's lacking the most? Mm, well, you can prove it by the size of this booth, right? It's it's the the leadership I would say you know you got a guy obviously Ron Cohen's you know hire the best people let them do their job works I mean it, you can't argue with it yeah and it's funny you bring that up because I've said over and over again to people I say there's a lot of good managers out there but there's not a lot of guys I follow into a burning building well and there's a big difference between just because you're good at your job doesn't make you a good leader, you know? Or just because you're busy that, doesn't mean you're productive. Oh yeah, but you know, the you got guys like, you know, Robbie Johnson's here, he was a platoon sergeant, you know, his job was to take mm -hmm. care of soldiers, you know, so is he good at his job? Yeah, he's great at his job, but he doesn't stray from, I gotta take care of the boys. You right. Know? If I take care of the boys, the boys take care of me. So that the, the leadership and, and then having a guy that's ultimately in charge who came from that background also, you know, uh, Mr. Cohen, he was in the Israeli Defense Force as a commander, you know, so he, he has that, he knows what it's like to rely on the guys that work for you completely. So it gives you a little bit different perspective of like, you know, hey man, sometimes the best thing I can do for you isn't, you know, kick you in the butt to get you to do your yeah. job. Maybe it's send you home so you can deal with your family yeah. so that'll get out of your head and you come back and do twice the work tomorrow, mm -hmm. you know? And well, that's yeah. that's the kind of stuff that motivates people. And then you come in here and you've got guys to your left and right that are I always, in my middle management class, one of the things, I've, I've only given it to, to 
some unique uh, military units, but I tell them like, when you're around excellence, it's easy to be excellent. It's very difficult I like to that. be when you're excellent. Around excellence, it's easy to be excellent. Yeah, I mean, if you think about it, like it, you know, rising tide raises all ships, right? Like if if, if I'm if I'm coming in on Monday, you know, I'm I'm kind of you know having a slow time, and you know you're you're hitting it hard and you're crushing it. Like you're like, all right, I got to get out. Let's you know, let's go. And by ten o'clock, I'm right there with you, and we're we're crushing it. But you I know, like it, it's and, and that's that's the atmosphere here. You know, like there are guys here that getting passionate conversations all the time. Mm -hmm. But it's because they care about what they're doing, and they're just wanting to make it better. Yeah. And you know, if you got a boss that'll fight with you, that's the best thing in the world. Most bosses say, "Go do it this way." Right. You know, if you got a boss that'll sit there well, and toe the line and I, I duke it out. Say, I always say, Daniel. They, they've heard me say it over and over again. There's two types of managers in this world. Only two. There's ones that assume everybody in the room is smarter than them until proven otherwise. Then there's ones that assume they're the smartest person in the room. Yeah. I can always work for the former. I can't work for the latter. <laughs> Another thing Mr. Cohen told me, he said, uh, he said, I already know what I know. I need to know what you know. If you're sitting in here and not not disagreeing or not having ideas or whatever, I, you know, I'm not getting anything out of you. So right. you need to, open, you know, no, you know, I, I, disagreement's I, not disrespect. Exactly. I, I agree a hundred percent. Disagreeing with someone is not a form of disrespect. Ron's an interesting guy, you know, and through the years. You know, I would send him these like, you know, four page emails breaking down oxygen, you know what I mean? And uh, you get like a one word answer, take care of it. You know, and like then you get it, it, it gets done. Very to the point, very direct, super awesome dude, just in every way, shape and form. Uh, you can tell he has his finger on the pulse, whether it's from afar or coming down I the mean, floor. I mean, he was down here on the show floor every yeah. day. I mean, I don't, I haven't been in other booths, but I don't imagine most CEOs are down there nope. answering product questions. No, you're absolutely right. You know? You're absolutely right. His he, his ability to kind of go from the floor all the way to the ivory tower is when it, really and it, it makes all the other you know all the other guys. It makes it so easy to to get down there and do it. You know, like if you see him doing, it, you're like, well, that's that needs to be me. You know, mm -hmm. so it, it's a great culture. You know, Tom Taylor, that uh, he's he's my boss. You know, he he's the same way. You know, he he takes care of his people. So they get the, the job done, and he enables their success to enable the company's success. I feel like Tom's been a, a, a figure in this business for so long. Oh, yeah. At some point at one of these shot shows, they're just going to build a statue to him at some <laughs> oh, point. He's, everybody loves Tom. You know, at some yeah. point. And it's because um, he takes care of his people. You know, and, and he's always in the middle of that floor. At some point, I'm, I'm always walking by. I'm like, aren't your feet killing you yet? Or, you know, um, but so gracious, and the team's so gracious, and you guys from the top down do a fantastic job, just from the leadership all the way down to the floor. And, you know, it's it's just one of those one of those things I'd love to see a lot of people come through here and, you know, take a look at what you guys are doing and understand the direction of the market and where things are going. Oh, I love it, man. You see, all, I mean, launched a thermal site, launched a BDX system for a crossbow, you know, like, and I, I work hard every single day to stay in contact with everybody to know about all the new stuff and I still show up and it's like, oh, we got a BDX for a crossbow? Like, <laughs> who knew? That's why, so. I, that's why I selfishly think, I, I said, I said, I'd love to see them get more aggressive and harder into soft goods. Selfishly, I'm always like, the, the brand I feel has got there, you know, and I saw what Vortex had done with their soft goods line and they were the ability to kind of put a nice line out there that isn't overly branded and yeah. it makes sense. And I was saying one day to Tom, just a conversation, I'm like, you guys got to push into that space. I'm like, it's it, it, you guys have the brand now, the recognition. And I think, you know, seeing how you guys do everything, it was something we were talking about. I, you know, what I love is it's not about the gun. It's about no. the brand. Yeah. When you come up to your booth, it's SIG and it's six hour. Mm -hmm. And it's branded and you don't have any, I mean, other than the back of your booth, there's not a lot of, you know, cheesy photos of someone holding the gun, trying to look cool. It's about the brand. Yeah. And I think at the end of the day, that's going to speak for itself because the people you're putting around it, the leadership, everything from the top down, and what you're doing here. Yeah, yeah, it's. I love it, man. I love showing up to work every day, getting a chance to go to the academy, you know. And oh, the academy's uh, Disneyland. I try to explain oh, yeah. that to everybody. Yeah. I, you know, Hannah will tell you. I grew up training with Todd, training with Cab. Cab and I probably sat through the first Armors P320 course together. You know. Really. So you know, I, I had the opportunity through the years. I was blessed. I try to tell people I came up in the old gun industry. I came up in the New England gun industry, traveling and going to Smith & Wesson, going to SIG, going to all these different companies. And that was how I had my start. And, you know, for me personally, it was always the Mecca. I would go to that, that academy and 
I was really spoiled because I didn't know how good it was till I left and I lived in Montana and I lived in Miami and then coming coming out here, I was like, I'm never going to see that. You know, that's not anywhere. Yeah. You know, nobody has a system like that. Nobody is doing it like that. So I get almost giddy and excited when I get the opportunity to see something like that or see a situation where a company is able to not only bring the products together, but also have the academy element with the instructors and oh, everything yeah. else. And it's just, it's really been a phenomenal, phenomenal journey to see what the brand has done in the 10, eight to 10 years I've been in the business and seeing it flourish the way that it is and just seeing the academy grow to the level that it's got to and seeing the instructors and the passion and everything else. And one of my passion plays, as you probably know, if you glance through my podcast, is to get some of those instructors on because they're quiet professionals, they truly oh, yeah. are. Having the opportunity to put them on and having them spend some time with you know, their audience and have them be heard. Yeah. Just get a voice behind them, you know? And they're such great guys, right? All the way down. I mean, Jerry Gallo, Todd Moriarty, you know, all those guys. Uh, Ruggiero, you know, it's just so many, you know? And then when I went to the academy out there in Mass, I had some of them as instructors through the years. Just so many cool, just such a collection of old and new and a mix. Just can't, you know, I, I can't put it into words till I get them all on air and everybody was able to hear them and, and hear yeah. their journey and hear their expertise. And it was one of the things I was talking to Todd about and his wife, I said, because she's like, he really needs to do more. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, he has a great story. People want to hear it. You just got to get a mic in front of him and let him, let him go. And a lot of them are like that because they're such quiet professionals all the way down, you know, and there's so many great folks. And I just love what's going on there. And I love the team all the way down, Hannah, Mike Jocelyn, you, you know, and just such great people. So I can't thank you enough oh, no, you know, for taking thank the you. time. Um, I know it wasn't easy. We kind of threw this together and it was one of those things, yeah. but you know, you're a great dude. Oh, you're going to kill you. it. You're going to crush it. Appreciate you know, I'm excited really, to be here. Yeah, really am. I'm, I'm looking forward to this year. I think it's going to be uh, a great one for you. And I'm really looking forward to what this platform brings to the table and what oh, yeah. it's going to look like in the years to come and how it's going to evolve and shape and yeah. change the industry. Yeah. If you're looking for a little lightweight 308, 65 Creedmoor, you know, or you want to try out the new ammo, I don't think you'll be disappointed. And maybe something bigger later. Never know. Man. Maybe. Maybe. Breaking news. <laughs> so I can't thank you enough, brother. Hey, thanks. It's been awesome. Appreciate y'all having me on. I appreciate it. Appreciate the time, y'all. And we're out.